Okay, we're good to go. They're actually seeing your presentation. Okay. Um, so, so are we ready? Yes, I'd like to introduce Dr. Glymore, who's from um, Kansas State University. He's giving our presentation today, and it's on ethics, so I will let him get started. Thanks very much. Thanks for, uh, for having me, for coming, or for, for coming, as the case may be. Um, uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, value society. Value society is a big, big, big area. I'm going to focus on one little bitty part. Um, uh, Today, I'm most curious about the ways in which you can find yourself doing immoral science, so um, ethical failures and the ways in which they arise. So I'm going to cover some ground that's um, relatively obvious and maybe some cases that you've already heard about, um, but also some stuff that's uh, maybe not so obvious and that you haven't heard about. So uh, I think you won't have heard about them. So we'll see. Um, and and instead, of, instead of doing this sort of Abstractly, I want to work from cases. So I'll give you, I'll give you a, a, a story about an origin, and then I'll exemplify with the, with the case from, from science of, of one sort or another. So how can you get bad science? How can you find yourself um, uh, uh, doing um, really bad, bad stuff as a, as a scientist or as, uh, as somebody who's applying science in, in medicine or engineering? Um, well, one way is that you can be a moral schmuck. So you, you, you yourself, right, you could be a fault because, because you're, you're a moral schmuck. And, and by this I mean, so that's just my name for a, a variety of persons who can see the consequences, the moral consequences of their actions, and, and care about morality. They just have the wrong moral theory. So they see the consequences, and they say, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with those consequences, right? I care about morality, but my evaluation says it's all right. Um, so, <clears throat> so they have the wrong moral theory, or in shorthand, they're evil. Right? So, um, uh, and sometimes evil, you know, not, very few of us choose to be evil, right? So, be, so this can sneak up on you, sort of, but um, here's a, a famous case. Most of you will have heard of this, this case of moral evil. So these are the um, Tuskegee studies. So are a, a, a long-term uh, observational studies of the progress of syphilis. The subjects were poor African-American uh, farmers, mostly sharecroppers. Uh, in Alabama, they were recruited to a study that began in 1932, ran for 40 years until 1972. It's actually a kind of sequence of, of trials that um, kept going over a, a, a largely the same body of men who were in, enticed into the program with promises of medical aid, they diagnosed with a subset of them, 400 or so, are diagnosed with syphilis. Um, they're told treatment will be provided, but, um, but it is not. In fact, some of them are not even told that they, they actually have syphilis. Physicians uh, observe over the, the course of the period um, what, what happens to the victim. So uh, Raymond Bondelier is on the, on the left. He's uh, one of the physicians who's in charge of uh, uh, the trials. And, and he happens to be in charge at a uh, particularly important period after um, antibiotics become widely available so syphilis is easily treatable. Um, he's in a position to uh, blow the whistle and ensure that the, uh, 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 patients, among them, uh, 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 Shaw on the right um, actually received treatment. He does not, right? Um, so, finally, it's not. It's not. Um, it's not that he he, do, he doesn't care. It's that he goes through a moral calculation in which African Americans um, don't have the full panoply of rights that the rest of us do, um, and so he's willing to sacrifice for the scientific knowledge gain. He's willing to sacrifice the well-being of the subjects, right? So. So, so this is this is one sort of obvious way in which you can find yourself doing moral science. So hopefully that's that, and presumably that that's that's obvious enough. That's not. It's not. Okay. All right. Here's a second way in which you can find yourself doing uh, in moral science. So you can be a moral imbecile. Right. So by this I mean somebody who refuses to think about moral consequences at all. So it's not that you're 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 evil. You have the wrong theory. Or you care about the wrong stuff. This is you just don't care at all. Um, and, and it turns out that science is, is replete with moral schmucks, but maybe even more, more replete with moral imbeciles. Um, this, uh, this is actually a pretty common um, state of being. Uh, and my favorite case, actually, is not a scientist, but an engineer, Thomas Mitchell Jr. I don't know how many of you have heard of this guy. He is uh, arguably the greatest chemical engineer ever. Um, uh, he, he really has this uh, long list of achievements that's, that's pretty amazing. Among them, he has the distinction of having destroyed the world not once, but twice, twice over. Right? 
Uh, and I mean that more or less literally. He ruined the world for us uh, for substantial chunks of time. So uh, here's the story of, of uh, Thomas Midgley. His first job is working for GM uh, uh, General Motors Company, removing uh, engine knocks. So if you don't know, engine knock occurs when you uh, when the fuel uh, air mixture is wrong, uh, it, the stock explodes too early in the cylinder, this is on the long run bad for the engine, um, and you, it reduces the power you get. So uh, it was a big deal. Um, uh, in 1916, Mitchell goes to work for GM. His job is to remove engine knock, and what he does is invent tetraethyl lead um, uh, and adds that to. Uh, uh, um. uh, so you should know some things about tetraethyl lead and Mitchell's, the history of this. So during the development of, um, of both tetraethyl lead as a, right, as a compound that, that sort of works and the, and the production of it, right, mixing with gasoline, about 15 people die uh, from lead poisoning. Midgley himself has to take a year off because he's suffering from lead poisoning. He has, he has to go air out for a year. Right? Uh, but uh, Midgley, and, and so this has been done, some of the deaths occur from industrial accidents. There's some, uh, there's some investigation. And Midgley says it's safe, right? He knows that it's not safe, right? Because he's been on, he's had to take time off. But he says, that, right, over oh, oh, the whole course of his career, this, this stuff is safe. Um, it's not safe. It's not just deadly. It has uh, small but really terrible consequences for development. We'll talk about those in a minute. What's important here is that you see, it's not that Mitchell is unaware of the consequences. It's not that he's unaware that some people are going to say they're immoral. It's that he just doesn't uh, care. It's a moral insult. So I, I should, I, before we go on to the, that's the effects of lead. The second way in which he destroyed the world, his second job was work with the Frigid Air Corporation, right? Uh, and he invents to replace ammonia, he invents the So, so this is a, this is a, a, a second, a second uh, uh, destruction of the world. Um, so back, back to lead just for a minute. I, it's important to understand just how invidious uh, this, this chemical is. Here's a case study, just one country. Um, in Egypt, because the elimination of, of lead is more recent in African countries, sometimes it's not clear that it's uh, eliminated. It's not eliminated in all of that. So, so sampling is better and methods are better. So this is a, a more recent study. It's, so it's Egypt rather than the U.S. or Europe. Uh, so here are the estimates. Um, 6,500 to, to 11.5, uh, uh, 11,000 change heart attacks per year, 800 to 1,400 strokes per year. Um, 6,000 to 11,000 premature adult deaths, just under 1,000 infant deaths per year attributable to lead exposure. Um, those are all immediately and obviously bad. Right? Here's a, a more subtle, but uh, maybe even worse consequence of lead exposure, and that's the, uh, that's the average law, loss in IQ, so about four and a quarter points is the, is the estimate. So you think about shifting the mean by four and a quarter points, you know, that, that's not all that big, you might think that's just not that big a deal. But actually, if you think about it sociologically, that shift is a really terrible result. So you think statistically for a minute, imagine you have a society um, with, a, with a, a normal distribution of uh, IQ. Um, and, and so these, these, these figures come from uh, a society about the size of the US circa 1990, so 260 million or something, uh, thereabouts. Um, and, and, a, and a society like that, you expect 6 million uh, a gifted people, and I think about one. So those are, those are folks from the top of the of the intellectual chain, um, and then and then six million in, in the in the terminology today, mentally retarded, or it's a developmentally disabled in one way or another. So if you shift the mean, you don't actually change the shape of that distribution. Right? You just shift the mean, and that has negligible consequences at the mean, but but huge consequences at the tails. So the number of gifted folks, right, is more than half. Right? Um, and uh, and the number of, of folks who are the mentally retarded end of the spectrum, right, so who require more support to live full, rich lives, um, and who are least likely to get it, right, in a in a, a, a developing uh, democracy, a third world nation, um, that, 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 that those guys increase by fifty percent. So the the social consequences of this are just are just disastrous. So we, we can do several lectures on the history of lead in the United States. If you don't know the name Kurt Needleman, his history is itself fascinating. For taking a look at, he's, a, he's a, the opposite, not a moral imbecile, but a but a, a scientific giant, morally speaking. Uh, sacrificed his career to the cause of eliminating uh, lead. 
Uh, okay, so um, so that, that's the that's the second way. And, and again, that should be you know, besides guns for hire, as you've probably seen or heard uh, about such. Um, here's a third way. And these are less common, but um, but in some ways are uh, maybe as damaging as uh, as any of the others. True believers. So what do I mean by true believer? So these are people who are morally aware, so they care about morality, they're thinking about the moral consequences of their actions, and roughly, so they're not moral imbeciles, and roughly have the right view about what's morally important. So, uh, so they want what is good. Um, but they're so convinced they're right uh, about their theories and the actions they take on the basis of their theories um, that they're unwilling to consider evidence that, in fact, they're doing great harm. So there are, there, there are rather fewer of these cases, but still some. Um, my favorite, because uh, he had an influence on the, an important influence on the life of my dissertation advisor, is this guy, Cyril Bird. So he, Bird is an extremely important psychologist, um, and he turns out to have been politically extremely influential in designing the education system in Great Britain that, um, that worked for uh, a couple of decades um, in the last half of the last century. Uh, uh, it's called the tripartite system. There are three kinds of schools. Students undergo a test. They get assigned to school on the basis of the test results. Um, and so at, at age 11, you, uh, in fact, at age 10, when you're either studying or not studying for the 11 plus exams, you decide your fate. Uh, I can go on to be an engineer or a scientist or a doctor. All right, that's not for me. I'm stuck as a clerical worker or I'm off to trade school to learn how to plumb. So that decision is made when you're quite young as a result of these tests. And Cyril Hart plays an important role in, um, in establishing that, that, that educational system. Well, how does that happen? Bird actually cares about the fate of um, children in England. He wants what's best for them. He believes that IQ tests are a good measure of intelligence. He believes intelligence is almost entirely genetically determined, so you can't mock with it, right? Um, and he thinks it's, it's just immoral to ask people um, to learn differential equations if they don't have the intellectual horsepower to do that. So what do you do? And you test, you test kids, you figure out who has the, who has the ability, you shoot them off of uh, more uh, uh, advantageous educational settings, and for students who don't have that intellectual horsepower, you dumb down the curricula so that you're not asking them to do what they can't do. Right? Um, uh, he's so convinced of his, uh, so convinced of, uh, uh, of his beliefs about IQ, uh, intelligence being measured by IQ, and IQ being heritable, <clears throat> that in fact invents that. Um, so this is uh, so this is a case of this is a case of. Uh, so can I? Pardon? Yeah, absolutely. Why, why couldn't Midgley be considered uh, a true believer too? Because Tetrarch of Lead, I mean, it really does work to keep engines yeah. from knocking, and CFCs really are good right. refrigerants. And you know, he just kind of didn't. Look at the other day. That's right. So, so if, if you thought Midgley, if you think Midgley cared about uh, about the fate of humans, um, uh, then th that would be the right day. He's a true believer. But but, he but, didn't care. but I, I so you know there's always some judgment here. But my guess about Midgley is he just didn't excuse the French fucking care. Right? Uh, he, right? He, he was willing to take he was willing to take the money, um, or, or probably because this is this is odd. He cared as much about the accomplishment being recognized as important as he did about anything else, right? Uh, the, the reputation played an essential. Um, but, but, but that's to say, he was sort of just unwilling to consider the moral dimensions of his decision. So, um, yeah, historians will have different readings depending on who you consult. That's my reading of Mitchell. But, um, but you, you understand the principal difference. There's some folk who just don't care, and there's some folk who, who, who who care, right? Uh, uh, but but uh, are so committed to their view about the world that they're insensitive to evidence that they might actually be doing harm, even by their own lights. Right? So so that's that Burke case. He was doing harm by his own lights. He just wasn't willing to entertain evidence. To, right? Okay. That's a great question. Other other session thoughts. Okay. So uh, so those are uh, those are those are cases where. It's sort of natural, easy to diagnose failure as a character flaw. So you might think, okay, I can protect myself from engaging in immoral science or immoral application of science just by being a good person, right? By, by ensuring I have the right moral character. Um, but it turns out it's actually not so simple. So I want to look at a, a couple of different ways in which you can end up doing immoral stuff 
um, uh, just as a, the natural diagnosis, and this arises from inattention to the context in which you're operating as a scientist or as a, as a medical professional or an engineer. So <clears throat> there are lots of these, and I'm just going to pick two. Um, one I'm going to call, uh, uh, that arises from what I call a change in inferential context. And importantly, this can get anyone, right? If you're using statistical methods ever, right, in any context, then you can get bit by this problem. So, uh, so if you don't stop and think about what's happening, you're liable to suffer a change in inferential context and you'll find yourself doing something desperately immoral without having meant that at all. So here's, a, uh, here's a, an easy illustration. So imagine you're tasked with designing a medical test. It's the early 1980s and the job is to diagnose HIV. Who's HIV? Who's got it? Who doesn't? So you're designing a medical test, and suppose you're told you want it to be 95% reliable. 95% of the time, it's going to get the right answer. Right? So you're going to get that some people have the disease, some people don't. You want it, overall, 95% of the time to be right. Um, and, well, if that's right, then you have a choice. Right? There's kinds of errors your test can, can generate. It can tell, tell you other people who actually have the disease that they are not sick. That's one kind of error. So, right? It's a false negative. Or it can tell you of, uh, of people who don't have the disease that they are sick. Right? So it's a false positive. I think they're reversed on the slide. False positives, right? Probably that's the chance that, that uh, the disease, the test comes back and says you have the disease when in fact you don't. False negatives, the chance that the, the test comes back and says you don't have the disease when in fact you do. As it turns out, you generally can minimize one or the other. Um, and that, that, has, that has, which one gets minimized has real implications, right? So, so let's just let's just, just to see what just to see the basic statistical problem. Let, let's run through a case, right? and then we'll talk about policy. So, imagine now that you're not the designer of the test, but the user of the test. So, you're a medical professional, <coughs> um, and you have a patient uh, who, who may be sick. You know some, some things about the disease. So, the, for ease, the numbers will make the numbers as follows: one in a thousand people in the risk group have the disease. Um, the test has equal rates of false positive and false negative, so it's not biased in either way. Um, uh, uh, and it's 95% reliable. Right? So that means that if, if you have a disease, 95% of the time it says that, 5% of the time it says you don't. If you don't have a disease, you're not sick, 95% of the time it says you're not sick, 5% of the time it says you're sick. Your patient has a positive result. What's the chance that the patient has a disease, has a disease given that you got the positive result? So as a physician, what kind of advice should you give? So you need to be really worried here, or yeah, we need to do some more tests, but you don't have to be really worried. Or, or, you know, what, what, what should you say about this situation? So, um, well, if you carry around a Bayes equation in your head, some of us do, but most of us don't, you can just right, whip out your pen and do the calculation. If you're really good, you can do it in your head. But most of us don't, so let's walk through it. The other way to do this, instead of, instead of actually doing the equation, is just think about it before. And, and, and so that's what we'll do. So I imagine you have 100,000 people. And that this is a fair represents a fair sample. So 100,000 people, you're going to give the test to all these 100,000 people. And um, of the 100,000 people, one in 100 or 100 total are sick, and 99,900 are healthy. Okay? You're going to give the test to the 100 sick people, and 95% of them are going to come back with a positive result. The test is correctly going to say they're sick. You're also going to give the test to the 99,900 non-sick people. And 5% of the time, the test is going to come back and say, you, you're sick, right? You know they're not. It's good. So that's 4,995 healthy people. So uh, all the positive results, 5,090 people, right, with positive results. And what do you know about your patient, just that your patient's in that box? So what is that? Well, 95 people in that box have the disease. And there are 5,090 people in the box. So the probability, uh, it's hard to see that. So the, so the probability that your patient actually has the disease is uh, 0.0187 or about 1 in 50. Okay. So that's way higher than it was, but it's still pretty low. Right? And so if you're not sensitive to this fact, you're liable to, you're liable to make some mistakes. In fact, this is a problem medical schools have, is, right? The training patients have a like not patients training uh, physicians how to responsibly understand the result of, uh, of uh, statistical tests. All right, so again, you can minimize false positives, you can minimize false negatives, generally you can't do both. And 
it may be really, really, really important to do one as opposed to the other. So, for example, if you're going to work in the Defense Department to build a polygraph that's going to detect right, liars, potential spies, it's really important to minimize false negatives. You don't want to let any potential spies pass. Sorry, we're laughing because they're currently shut down. <laughs> they, they are no time right? <laughs> yeah. Go to it, right? They quit, right? <laughs> Problem too hard, we're done. Uh, right, so, uh, so, so you really want low rate of false things. But once you build this polygraph, right, it's easy as a professional user to take it to other contexts, for example, court system. Um, and, and, but here, you want, it's the other way. You really, really don't want you, false positives, right? You, you want that, that false positive. You want to falsely convict as few people as possible. So if you've minimized the defense department rates of false negative, you have not minimized rates of false positive. And so it's inappropriate now to be using this technology in a criminal context. Right? Um, uh, uh, here's a routine case. We'll just pick the mammography, but this happens all the time in medical settings. You develop a new, a new uh, uh, test to detect a, a, a really nasty disease, breast cancer. Um, uh, regular screening. Minimizes the rate of false negatives, right? You're going to catch more cancers earlier, and so be able to treat them earlier uh, 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 if, you, if you do systematic screening. But you will also get false positives, and those false positives get treatment, and sometimes that treatment, always that treatment is, is harmful. Sometimes the healthy patients, sometimes it's, it's more than just harmful, it, it's, it's really disastrous. Um, so what's the right balance there? Well, that's a hard ethical question. And the important thing is, it's an ethical question, right? You, if, if, you're not, if you don't think about it, um, you're likely to find yourself adopting positions that are morally irresponsible. Right? So whatever in the end you think the right answer is, you got, you got to think about it. Right? So I can sneak up and bite. So, so is that, are, are we okay, okay with this, this sneaking up and getting questions about this way of, of being bitten by ethics? All right, one more then. Um, so these are really hard ethical problems. Uh, they're, just, they're just hard. And because they're hard, it's uh, kind of easy to duck them in one way or another. Um, uh, uh, but if you aren't willing to think hard, you're likely to find yourself in something more responsible. So I would illustrate with one really hard moral problem. Concerns advocacy. So here's the, here's the case. We've known for a long time, since the 50s, that exposure to television violence is stably associated with aggressive behaviors in children in joint violence. So if you take a bunch of kids, you show them TV, uh, the kids who get shown violent TV will be more aggressive to the peers over the next couple of hours than kids who are shown not. Right? You can reproduce that experiment. Unlike me, you can reproduce that one pretty well. Uh, further, mean exposure to television violence and rates of aggressive behavior for adults are associated across groups, so counties, states, countries. Look at the rate of television exposure, exposure to televised violence, and adult aggression, um, those, those, there's, a, there's an association. And furthermore, if you track children from a young age to adulthood, you'll see that children who are exposed to more televised violence, watch more uh, television, um, are more aggressive as adults. Uh, until about 10 years ago, uh, uh, you, 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 uh, that, that, that was the entirety of the information available. And it's problematic because uh, these are observational studies and there are two ways to explain those stable associations on the long time scale, right? Between childhood exposure and adult aggression. So, well, three, really. So, it may be that childhood exposure causes adult aggression. So that's, that's one view, it's a pretty popular view with folks who think there's something bad about televised violence. But it might be that there's a common cause, and really there are two kinds of common causes. It might be that there's a personality trait that some people have. It makes them watch more TV, like violent TV in particular. And also makes them, as adults, fun. Definitely, it might be some environmental factor. The level of violence or aggression in your neighborhood, the parenting strategies your, your parents adopt, your level of income, um, uh, how much schooling you get. Right? That environmental factor might cause both um, your uh, exposure to televised violence as a child and your adult aggression. And to sort these out, you the only way to do this, short of an experiment, a randomized trial, which you can't do with of people, is to track those potential causes. And in 2002 and 2003, a pair of studies came out that finally did that. So they, they tracked a, a big chunk of people from early in their childhood all the way through uh, their adulthood and into their 30s um, and, uh, and measured uh, just a whole slew of those potential environmental risk factors and personality. 
So there's a study by Heusman and all in 2003. That's the study that psychologists find most uh, important. But there's a study by Johnson uh, in 2002 in Science of Got More Press. Um, they both have the same result. Uh, the, the result is that even if you control for the potential common causes, there's this association. Right? So you do the regression, it's kind of fancy kind of off the note. Regression, but at the end of the day, it's just regression. And what it says is you see an association. Um, so it's probably not, in other words, it's probably not a common cause. Okay. It turns out, however, that regression is really bad method for doing this. It, it's the uh, most widely used method far and away, but it's bad and for technical reasons, which I'd be happy to talk about at There are fun technical reasons, but they need not detain us here. So, um, but, but there are better methods, right? And so uh, a set of folks reanalyzed the data using the better methods. Importantly, um, the statistics differ for men and women. So if you're doing this right, you actually want to control for that difference. One, the easy way to do this is a, a variable with two values, if you're male and female, right? The easy, it's just produce an analysis for the different subsets. So the best causal graph, so we have pruned from here a whole set of variables that actually appear in the reanalysis and in the original studies. But the best causal graph for male subjects, what you're really worried about is, the, uh, I'll do a key, some, some people will see this, that, that you're really worried about the association between adult televised violence and adult composite aggression, right? So is watching television now the cause of aggression? Bruce, yeah. you probably use the mouse on uh, oh, right, yeah, good idea. So, uh, so we're really worried about the association between these two guys and between these two guys. Child television, violence viewing, and adult aggression. Did that show up? No? No, it didn't show up. Okay, so, uh, so upper left is child TV, upper right is adult composite aggression, just below adult composite aggression is adult TV violence. We want to know what, are there causal edges there, are there associations or not? Are there, are there associations, and if there are associations, are those best explained by causation? For males, the answer is there's no, there's no reason to think there's a causal connection between adult TV viewing and adult aggression, but there is reason to think that there's a causal influence of child exposure and adult aggression. So for male children, it looks like exposing them to TV violence causes them to be aggressive as an adult. And that's what, that's what Hoisman and Green et al. infer. The results are interestingly different for women. So here, it looks like child, so now child TV violence viewing, the child exposure is upper right, below that is adult aggression, and below that is adult TV violence. Child TV violence viewing has various causes, but doesn't look like it causes adult aggression at all. But adult violence viewing does. So the, the policy lesson the, the really stupid, trivial policy lesson, right? The, the one, the unrefined policy lesson is don't show male children violent TV, but once they're adults, they can watch whatever they want. Don't sh uh, you can show female children violent TV until the cows come home, but once they hit 16, they're banned, right? No, no, don't worry about the TV, right? So that's the, right, that's the, that's the, the, the sort of easy lesson. So it's, okay, so here's the puzzle. If you're doing this reanalysis, right, this is a kind of interesting result. Um, uh, uh, what do you say by way of policy recommendations when, when you're writing up the results, right? So should you, should you say anything about policy at all, right? So maybe you say, no, we're purists, right? If this is science, you shouldn't talk about policy. But that's a problem, and it's particularly a problem for social science and, and for biomedical science, right? Because we care about the science at all only because we want to intervene to make the world better, right? So if you're not, if you're not saying anything about the correct interventions, why the heck is the public funding? Well, they're not anymore. They shut down. <laughs> they shut down the federal government. But why were they funding funds, right? So, so, um, but if you are going to make recommendations, you want to think about them really carefully. So, you know, so there's some obvious. You, you can say, look, we have a censorship. We have a censor. We have to engage in ad campaigns, just like we advertise against smoking, right? We get advertising against. You uh, tell parents, you know, put your kids in the car seat, don't let them smoke, and don't let them see five and or we could, the social epidemiologists really like these kind of, kinds of uh, um, uh, uh, behind the scenes interventions, like providing midnight basketball, right? And there's a whole host of things the epidemiologists like. Gets kids active, right? Gets them away from the TV, reduces reduces kid on kid violence, right? It does all kinds of good stuff, right? Um, so you could, you could recommend any of these various policies at, at any level of explicitness. Um, but now note that, so this is. This is the hard ethical problem that arises, but only when you think about it. Suppose you recommend, so that 
it might be it might be really really obvious to say censorship that's too much you shouldn't be recommending that maybe you recommend ad campaigns but even that's a little contentious but certainly you want to say midnight basketball is a good idea right? well th- uh, hold on just think about that for a minute so these results say that midnight basketball is a really good idea for male children it has no effect on female children and now I suppose you're LA or New York or Chicago big city right under limited budget so. You can afford right, to fund males, but, but males and females, that's a big mess right there. So maybe you can satisfy his policy. If that's a problem. Right? It's a problem that as a scientist, do it, right? You gotta think about it before so whatever way you come out, you gotta think about it. If you don't think about it, right, you, you just you're throwing your moral fate out on the winds, right? You're hoping for the best, right? You gotta think about it. Right? So it's a hard problem. It's not clear what the right answer is. But if you don't think about it, almost certainly you get it. So, um, <clears throat> some principles to consider with that particular kind of problem. Your job is to inform uh, uh, people so they can make informed decisions. Information that's not believed is of no use, so that's a reason to suspect that advocacy is a good idea. Decisions require facts and values. People tend to be unwarrantedly optimistic. They deny facts when those conflict with their desires. You've all heard, got to confuse me with facts, my mind's made up. Somebody said that at some point in... in in your history, you've heard somebody say that, right? Well, that's unwarranted optimism. Scientists are, are not experts with respect to value unless you choose to make it, right? That's not what your training does. You can choose to make yourself an expert, right? You can go get extra training, but your official training is not going to emphasize that. Right? Um, but you are nonetheless confronted, whether you know it or not, with really serious ethical questions. Uh, so scientists ought to take value seriously, both their own and, and those of others, and they need to ask continuously and seriously really two things. How do I best promote well-being for everybody who's affected by what I do while respecting autonomy, right? without, without violating the rights of the, the people who are consuming my science or, or the people who are affected by the policies adopted as a result of my science. So how, how do you do that? How do you best promote uh, uh, well-being while respecting autonomy? Well, we can do lots and lots of right, a whole semester or five or ten on doing that. But here, here's, some, here's some easy, quick advice. You need to ask that question at three sort of levels of time. So in your daily life, right? In your lab, in your practice, in your office operation, in your day-to-day work in the, uh, your work environment. The, the way we interact, right, my crew, right? This way it, it, those folks interact with one another. Does that, in fact, respect autonomy while promoting well-being? Uh, 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 with your choice of research topic or area of specialization, you're making decisions about those, and those decisions have consequences. You have economy too, right? So there's a free choice here, but those choices have consequences, and you ought to think about it. Um, and the method you use, so this is the, the testing. In your profession as a whole, this is one of the things that, especially for, for younger students, slides underneath that's not on their radar, but it's really important. Your profession sets standards, right? Um, and it, it either enforces them or it doesn't. And, you, and typically, those professional organizations are democratic. You have a voice in what standards there are, are in place and how they're enforced. Um, so you need to ask, participate in those professional societies, um, and, uh, and, and, and play a role in determining what policies are, 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 are out there and how they're enforced. Um, and then, <clears throat> more widely, socially, the decisions to make about collaboration with industry and with government um, Really serious ethical issues arise in both. So I know a, a fellow who turned down drugs is now a big issue. So this guy turned down a ton of federal money to develop robot soldiers, AI. Um, uh, and for him, that was the reason to turn it down was it's an ethical, uh, ethical issue. Right? So um, you really want to give the government the ability to kill people without putting people at risk. And it's not an easy question, but it's, it's the kind of thing you got to ask. And then, especially in biology all over the place, advocacy for policy or values. And this really, you know, there's some disciplines where this is common advocacy is just accepted. If you're an epidemiologist, you are expected to advocate for, uh, for health, uh, health values, right, as a, as a part of what happens. Um, uh, but, but it, and, and, and so some kinds of environmentally oriented population biology, right, this is what it used to be a big deal, like in the 70s, but it's now pretty standard and some kind of advocacy is supposed to go on. But in other areas, it's not so. Physicists going to be a little shaky. So, 
All right, um, so you can do all of those things uh, uh, and so on, a, on a daily basis, period of semesters. You can take part in the ethics discussions in your lab or your department, right? Um, uh, and if there aren't any, you can organize them. Get people to focus on, and like anything else, you get better at ethically reasoning, reasoning ethically, or reasoning about ethics if you do it. Like practice, practice is actually important. Um, uh, so, so do that. If there isn't a place to do it, organize one. You can take ethics courses. Right? Um, they're not necessarily required. You know, often there's one is required. You can take more than one, right? And not just applied courses, but theoretical courses. Right? Philosophers have spent 2,500 years thinking about this stuff. Um, and we don't always get results, but, um, but sometimes we do. And even when we don't get results, we can tell you something about how to think carefully, right? So, so that you, may, you may get it wrong, but you won't get it wrong by accident. Right? It will have been a carefully considered error. Right? So, uh, so, so take those, right? you, right? you, or just sit in. Right? Um, uh, take courses that read and relate to subjects. So it's not, it's not just ethics, but political philosophy, philosophy of science, game theory, decision theory, policy-oriented political science and economics, policy-oriented history, and the history of your particular field, whatever, right? Um, th those, are, those are replete with evolution. So uh, um, I, haven't, I haven't thought about this for a while, but when I used to teach medical ethics, um, I, I took some time to talk about the development of uh, prenatal care and neonatal care in this country. Right? So uh, it's a big ethical decision that was made with nobody paying attention to what the hell was going on. Um, and it's it had long lasting consequences in lots and lots of ways, for lots and lots of people. Right? Um, that's, um, you know, understanding what's going on there is partly a matter of political science, it's partly a matter of economics, and partly a matter of philosophy, partly a matter of biology. So, stuff from all over matters. Right? Um, so, pay attention to ethics policy and policy discussions in your field, contribute to them, right? Um, uh, and encourage others to do the same. If you read Nature of Science, every issue, there are a couple of letters which are sort of devoted to ethics. It's worth reading. It's worth reporting. Um, and most importantly, be aware. This is a kind of Buddhist injunction. Right? Live mindfully. Right? Everybody goes mindfully of the, of the kind of ethical considerations that beset you, whether you're aware of them or not. So, so be aware, be sensitive, and, and, and take them seriously. Okay, I'm done. I'll shut up now. Um, but so that we can show you to the audience. Okay. So Bruce has opened the question, the, the floor to the audience. Hi there, I'll start out. This is Virginia Ryder at Pittsburgh State University. Hi, Virginia. Uh, one, Hi, Virginia. I, uh, I enjoyed your talk, and I'd like you to comment on the apparent conflict that exists now in that when, when I was training, we were taught not to interject um, personal views, et cetera, into our scientific data and that things really had to be presented as factual. And I get out of your talk that you're encouraging now broadening that viewpoint. And do you see a conflict there in people's personal views coming into the scientific arena? Yeah, so that's a really terrific question. And I think, I think what I want to say is your training was bad um, and, and really desperately bad. Uh, uh, Perfectly common for that the case uh, that, that people were trained that way. You're not, you, 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 as a scientist, you're supposed to stick to the facts and avoid values. Um, but, uh, but, but the truth is that you can't do science without um, without making value. Uh, and um, you know, if, if I were doing another talk, um, I, I'd tell you about how uh, about how value commitments and particular commitments to the the truth, the discovery of the truth about how the world works, how those commitments um, uh, underwrite science and aren't incumbent, right? Um, so, so people can perfectly legitimately say, I value the truth a whole lot less than I value other things. Um, in particular, for example, the well-being of, of individual people, right? Von der gets it wrong. He gets it wrong because he prioritizes truth over the well-being of people, right? Um, and, and so you can't do science without value commitments. 
What you can do is be clear about what those value commitments are. Um, and so, so I think that's, I, I think there is a conflict. I think we ought to reject the old stick to the facts, it's only the facts, um, and, and, and instead um, be engage in, in value judgments, but just be clear about the, the values we're using when we do that and, ha and how we prioritize various values one, one against the other. So, um, so part of that is because you can't do science without values with it. So do you think that's, you said Virginia was badly trained. Yep, I so, think a bad so of yep. uh, I would argue that the values have changed so that when Virginia was trained, that was the value. Just like in 1900, smoking was well accepted and everybody did it. Essentially, yeah. or even into, into the 1950s. Watch Magnum. Yeah. Um, so now we know smoking is bad, so we encourage people not to do it. So now our values have changed. So it isn't necessarily that training was bad. It's just that the values that we have yeah. are, are are changing. Yeah. So good. So this is, this is, a, this is a really hard puzzle in a in a better business model. So. So I disagree. I think you're wrong. Um, uh, 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 and I wish I had a demonstration. So, so you're a true believer. That that I am indeed. I am indeed. Uh, so uh, so so one way to understand your point is is this: there are no objective facts about what's morally correct and what's what's not morally correct. These these, these facts change depending on how how our beliefs change. As our beliefs and commitments change, right? The facts about what we ought to do and not not to do change. Um, and uh, so, and that's a pretty common that's a pretty common view. I don't think it's right. Right. So my own view is that there are objective facts about morality. Right? So some facts about morality depend on on, on, how, on how people believe. So well-being matters, and well-being depends on what you care about. But other facts about morality are insensitive to beliefs. In particular, facts about the pond are relatively insensitive to how beliefs change. So that's a hard issue. So I may not, I'm actually not a true believer. I mean, I think that's right. Um, but deciding that is a hard, deep, long-standing question in moral epistemology. And I, I, nobody has good arguments on either side. So either position is stupid. So it's perfectly acceptable to disagree here. What's important is to be clear about what one is disagreeing. Right? Um, and so, so if you say, if you say, look, I, I don't think the has changed. The training was bad. I think the values have changed. And now we ought to engage in explicit. Then, then I say, well, I disagree with the metaphysics, metaphysics of morals implicit in your, in your in your position, but I agree with the policy recommendation. Maybe that's what's important. Right? The policy recommendation is the same either way. You ought to think ethically about what's going on, right? Um, and uh, and do so explicitly. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know if that if that helps or or, 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 or hurts, but 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 maybe it helps. So if there was one book that you would recommend for students to read. Just one. Just well, just one. All right. They have lots of other things they've got to do. So if you've got one book for them to read, what is it? <laughs> um, let me respond by giving you three books depending on your interests. So one kind of interest you might have is, what does high ethics look like? So if people are doing philosophy, uh, ethics, theoretically. So I'm not talking about apples. What's the theory? What does that look like? Uh, and, and, and how are you doing it? Can it actually be applied to real world situations? You can't do better than John Stuart Mill. Um, and you can, choose, you can choose indifferently between on liberty and, uh, and uh, utilitarianism. Equally good. They'll, they'll show you what high ethics looks like when you do it in the theory, and Mill connects it uh, to live problems of his day. Uh, you might care about um, a really concrete illustration of ethical problems uh, in, a, in, a, in a scientific domain. So somebody who's sensitive to ethics, but also knows how the science works and is, and is careful. Uh, Philip Kitcher's Vaulting Ambition is a, is a, a story about uh, the failures of sociobiology. Um, and it's, uh, if, you're a, if you're an evolution biologist, um, it's good science. 
commentary on science, um, that how to do that sort of science better, uh, and, and Philip is uh, is really is really good with, uh, with the evidence. Would you mind writing the names down? Ah, uh, sure. All right, hey. <laughs> Let's see. So, uh, John Stuart Mill. Utilitarianism. Or on liberty. Uh, and then we have, uh, and then we have uh, Kitcher. So that's Philip. For everybody on the network, we'll send this out. We'll have Bruce send this out as an email to Sarah, and she can send it out to everybody. Right, Sarah? Absolutely. All the ambition. Um, and uh, well, let me stop there. There, there, there. That, that, that's enough. It's there. two. That's too. Um, well, well, the literature is rich, so it, uh, you know, from really cool stuff like the Green Revolution, right? Um, there's a host of stuff written about the good stuff, and you may not know it, but also the really evil black stuff. Um, so uh, it's got both sides, um, and, and 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 you can write that. Don't, don't, it's cool stuff. Uh, so you know, pick a bit of science. There's, there, there's stuff written. Like yeah, so um, the Henrietta Lacks, right? Yeah, so yeah. I think that was the book. So, you know, and it just came up in the presentation. So, um, because, you know, I mean, do, do you know the details? Uh, I, I know roughly this one. Okay, so. So, 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 so she, without her permission, cancer cells are, are, are taken and they're used, uh, and so. so a large percentage of the cell lines used in cancer research are Henrietta's. Yeah. Uh, so there are ethical issues involved with her and her exploitation of her and her family. There are also scientific issues involved with the fact that this is a single, a single lineage. Right? Yeah. Right here, yeah. So. And so, and most likely, as yes, you know, so in fact, lots of others, right. and, you know, so we all wonder what we study, right? Um, so at the time of the S3, these cells were taken. This was a practice. It's um, yeah. For consent was in. That's right. One, right. You know, so, and, and I completely agree, this is morally, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. Right. I think there is an absolute value there, which was recognized at that point, so, given that she, you know, was yeah. And um, so after all of this, right, so the press, you know, so NIH, so a researcher in Europe just published the genome, right? It was published in Nature or Science. And so this went through peer review. This went through an editor of like so, you know, the pinnacle of you know, sort of, you know, where biomedical research is published, right? That published these letters on ethics all the time. That's right. That's right. And then <clears throat> all hell broke loose. Um, so the paper was retracted. So Steinmetz, who is the PI actually on this um, paper, then went back discussed with the family and you know there was you know in that age finally you know, when they were still working um, came and you know so met and um, so what do you think happened there? I mean yeah so so I, I mean I understand the original but the collapse of you know like I mean so many levels I mean this was yeah. are these all in the source? Uh, uh, in this case, yeah, so, so, you know, that, that distinction between, uh, is actually an interesting feature in the problem in psychology. Um, we tend to uh, explain behavior by attributing character traits, and it's not the character trait itself, it's character trait plus context, uh, and, 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 and all of us are prone to, to moral imbecility in the right context. And, 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 and so one doesn't want to say that, uh, that the whole collection are moral imbeciles systematically. Well, one rather wants to say uh, that this was an outbreak of imbecility, right? For each of them, at least at this moment in their career. Is that an example of group thing? Yeah, the, yeah. So uh, almost certainly some, some people are saying, well, this looks questionable, but nobody else higher up is willing to whistle, so I'm not going to, right? It must, it must have passed peer review or. Right, some kind of ethical check at some point. Uh, others simply don't care because right, they're 
Maybe not because they need evil, right? But because this is a really cool set of information and I want it out there. So, so, so another illustration. Go back to go, go, go back to Mitchell. So, so Mitchell gets it wrong in truly disastrous ways with respect to uh, with respect to Ted Moore tonight. What he does with respect to CFCs is actually is actually morally much more interesting. So ammonia as a coolant is a problem. Right? I mean, this is dangerous stuff. You really don't want it hanging around. Right? Um, uh, uh, and, and besides, it's not actually terribly, terribly efficient. CFCs save lives. Right? The, 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 their immediate consequence is good. And and Midgley's not in a position to know about the long-term effects. Right? So here the failure is not in the silver. Right? It's, whatever's going on there, when you destroy the second time, it's different than what, what happens with the... So, um, so, so I, you know, I wouldn't want to take a position on, on this, but, but I'm pretty sure there's some groupthink. I'm pretty sure there's some facility. You know, people aren't in the facility. This is the moment that they're in the facility. We all have yeah, group, yeah. yeah. But, like, so in the context of, you know, this being, like, being so public, right? Yeah. So, so, so a reminder of how easy it is for this stuff to sneak up and bite you in the back. If you are not actively engaged, if you're not saying to yourself every day, the same way you say, what are the problems, scientific problems I'm addressing today, but, you know, what's the data I'm collecting, what's the set of analysis I'm going to do, what are the ethical problems, <laughs> you're likely to, like, you're more likely to face that situation than not. And if you face that situation. All right, are there any more questions or... Um... Maybe we can wrap up now. Would everybody like to give a hand? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for coming and presenting for us. All right. You're welcome.